very end. Um, if you would like to donate to the Friends of Law, uh, Land, Air, Water, and support stipends for students doing unpaid public interest environmental law internships this summer, the link to donate uh, will be in the Q&A function. Um, and so this panel is focused on protecting animals uh, because it promotes human health and resilience in the face of a changing world. The man-made threats that our planet faces are immense and major reforms are necessary to ensure that humans and animals can continue to thrive into the future. Climate change, habitat destruction, wildlife trade, pollution and industrial animal agriculture are poisoning the planet and human survival is dependent on whether we can fix our broken relationship with nature. Our first panelist is going to be Kate Duleski from the Animal Welfare Institute. Um, and she's going to focus on how species extinction negatively impacts human society and economy and how the mitigating effects of climate change in, on biodiversity is vital to keeping our planet habitable for humans. Uh, next, we will have Ingrid Sagerman from the American Society for the Protection, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And she will be focused on how industrial animal agriculture concentration uh, animal feeding operations, CAFOs, not only have severely negative impacts on animal welfare, but also present serious risks to the environment and public health and of neighboring communities, which are disproportionately people of color and community com communities and low income communities. And lastly, we'll have Kate Wall from the International Fund for Animal Welfare, who will be focusing on unsustainable habitat destruction and the global wildlife trade, both legal and illegal, and the results, resultant staggering declines in abundance and diversity of species. Um, so let's get started. Thanks, Lisa. Let me just get my screen shared here. Okay, uh, thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm really glad to be here talking with you about these topics. Uh, my presentation is gonna be about improving human resiliency by advancing biodiversity protections, specifically through the lens of climate policy. And I wanna begin by highlighting the severity of the biodiversity crisis that we're currently facing. I doubt this is new information to any of you, but I really wanna emphasize how critical it is for us as humans to alter our relationship with nature, not only for the sake of wildlife, but also to protect our own ways of life. And the science that has accumulated on this topic in recent years is really staggering. Um, reports have come out showing that 1 million species worldwide are at risk of extinction, many of them within just a few decades, and the population sizes of mammals, birds, fish, amphibians, and reptiles have dropped an average of 68% since 1970. And, you know, these deteriorating ecosystems aren't just a problem for the wildlife that are declining, it also has grave implications for us as humans, for our economies, our livelihoods, food security, health, and our quality of life worldwide. And one of the co-authors of a key report that pointed to this biodiversity decline said it really well. He said, the essential interconnected web of life on Earth is getting smaller and increasingly frayed. This loss is a direct result of human activity and constitutes a direct threat to human well-being in all regions of the world. So we know beyond a doubt that this biodiversity crisis is dire, but it hasn't been recognized or included in national conversations on par with other crises like climate change. And so one of our strategies in our advocacy community over the past few years has been to illuminate this connection and the interplay between biodiversity and climate 
in the hopes of creating progress on wildlife protection as a piece of all this energy and momentum that has built up around the climate conversation. And the basic links that we have tried to draw between these two topics are the three that follows. So first, and this is pretty obvious, that climate change is causing species extinction. In fact, it's among the top five leading direct drivers of species decline. And there are a ton of examples that I could highlight for you. Um, for one, hurricanes and other extreme weather events damage habitat and they harm populations of migratory birds. Uh, there's shrinking and thinning sea ice that makes it more difficult for Arctic species like polar bears to hunt and mate. Um, Climate change has caused new patterns of drought that have contributed to a 45% decrease in the number of invertebrates, including a lot of pollinators over the last 35 years. Another one is sea level rise, warming and acidification of our oceans. These have affected all sorts of marine species. So it's indisputable that climate change is affecting biodiversity. Um, but the second link that we have drawn here to policymakers is that species decline due to climate change also negatively impacts human well-being and survival. Um, and like I highlighted in the last slide, human communities and economies are completely dependent on biodiversity and on resilient ecosystems. Uh, one example of this is that native insects provide more than $4.5 billion in pest control, and they pollinate more than $3 billion in crops just here in the United States alone. They're also food for wildlife that support a multi-billion dollar outdoor recreation industry. And you know, another example, I think something that's top of mind for a lot of people right now is public health. Amphibian species are declining at alarming rates. Nearly one third of them are already extinct or threatened with extinction. And these amphibians help control insects like mosquitoes and ticks. And burgeoning populations of those insects are leading to increases in illnesses like West Nile virus, malaria, Lyme disease, things that affect humans. So it's really not a stretch to say that the loss of biodiversity due to climate change threatens our very survival as a species. And the third link here is that protecting species and their habitats that are declining due to climate change can actually directly offset some of the effects of climate change and make us more resilient as a species. So like I said before, pollinators are severely impacted and protecting them, you know, birds, bats, insects is really vital as agriculture becomes increasingly challenging in a changing climate. In addition, protecting wetlands, which hosts thriving ecosystems, provides this vital buffer between human communities and high water, which can come from severe storms and flooding from a changing climate. And imperiled species and their ecosystems can also absorb carbon and sequester it within themselves or within the ground. And so that's another way that protecting these species will really help to offset some of the worst effects we feel from climate change. So these efforts that we've made to draw clear lines for policymakers between climate change, biodiversity loss, and human resilience have help to ensure that all of these topics are part of the same policy conversations. And one example of this that I wanna highlight for you is a comprehensive report released by the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis in 2020. And this report devoted an entire section to highlighting the importance of preserving biodiversity. And one of the things that they wrote was that Meaningful protections for wildlife are critical to address this biodiversity crisis and provide species the resources and tools to survive in the face of a change in climate. At the same time, intact ecosystems are highly effective carbon sinks. So drawing those exact same lines that I had been talking about before and bringing all these conversations together. And this same report made a series of recommendations of how to protect biodiversity for the sake of minimizing impacts on climate change. These recommendations included establishing a wildlife corridor system, implementing a national landscape conservation strategy, 
um, helping private landowners to conserve habitat and helped wild, help wildlife, and also improving implementation of the Endangered Species Act. So that was a positive outcome of these linkages that we've been trying to draw. But unfortunately, a lot more progress has been lost than was made over the past four years. And we have a lot of ground to make up now. The Trump administration was adversarial towards science-based policy making, and they really took us backward, both in terms of climate and in terms of biodiversity policy. And since I just touched on the Endangered Species Act as a component of that climate report, I also want to explain the ways that the Trump administration weakened implementation of this law and you know, then follow it up, of course, with what needs to be done to fix that. So back in August, <clears throat> excuse me, August 2019, the administration finalized three rules that undermine this law in a whole series of ways. These regulations included curtailing perfect protections afforded to threatened species, enabling economic considerations to be, uh, economic data to be collected when the government was deciding whether or not to list a species, uh, significantly weakening the process for designating habitat that these species need in order to recover, dismantling the interagency consultation process, which meant that the voices of experts in government were effectively silenced when determining how federal projects would move forward. And they also, these regulations minimize consideration of the effects of climate change on species survival, which as we know, is of course a huge driver of extinction. And they weren't done there. In December 2020, the administration finalized two additional rules. Um, these further undercut habitat protections for species listed under the Endangered Species Act. And taken together, these two rules limited what could be considered habitat and potentially excluded areas that required restoration or modification in order to recover a species or areas for which the economic cost of protecting that habitat outweighed the benefits. And these rules were designed to fast track development and they failed to account for the fact that species historic ranges are now shifting due to this changing climate and due to these species seeking out uh, habitat that is suitable to them in new and different areas. And you know there needs to be more flexibility in designating habitat for this situation not less. So while there were certainly significant setbacks during the Trump administration, both these regulations I've highlighted and others, and there's still so much work to be done in undoing the damage that he caused, we still as a community managed to lay this solid foundation of awareness and enthusiasm for biodiversity reforms as an integral component of climate policies. And so that set the stage for the arrival of the new administration under President Biden. And along with his arrival come opportunities to advance biodiversity protections through newly energized climate directives. And he started with a bang. On day one, he made it clear that action on both of these crises would be a priority for him. He signed an executive order to restore science and tackle the climate crisis. And this executive order mandated a review of Trump era rules. And it included many of those that I just talked about that undermine the Endangered Species Act. Um, also on day one, President Biden temporarily halted oil and gas activity in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which was something else that had been put into place under President Trump. And this again demonstrated a commitment to not only keeping fossil fuels in the ground, but also protecting this pristine habitat for species that lived on that refuge. And a week later, uh, he kept coming there on January 27th was Climate Action Day and as part of this, President Biden signed another executive order on tackling the climate crisis. And it included further recognitions of how inextricable extinction is from climate action and how 
our resilience depends upon both. So one of the things this executive order did was establish a 30 by 30 policy to permanently protect 30% of the nation's undeveloped lands and waters by 2030. This is an all of government approach, a directive to each department and agency to incorporate this mandate into the work that they do. And this executive order also created the Civilian Climate Corps to hire Americans, create jobs, and put them to work uh, in part protecting biodiversity in the US. So um, these were some really monumental step forwards if you're talking about just the first week or two of the administration. And I, as excited as I am about this forward momentum, the strategy of tying biodiversity policy to this energy around climate reform isn't a permanent solution. And it's not the attention that the extinction crisis itself truly deserves. So now that we're not playing defense anymore with a hostile administration, and now that we have piles of scientific evidence supporting the dangers of allowing this web of life to disintegrate, it's really time to elevate the biodiversity conversation to its own distinct platform, separate from climate. And this isn't to say that there isn't still a lot of work to be done at the many points of intersection with climate change, but just to say that we need a more expansive perspective than we're currently taking. It's not just a warming world that threatens human survival, it's also the disappearance of all the life forms living within it. And so I just wanna end on that note and list three recommendations among many that are out there um, of how to elevate the biodiversity conversation to its own area of policy. The first is to repeal Trump's modifications to the ESA and to fully fund its implementation. So it's not enough to just undo the damage that was done. Uh, this law has also been starved for money for a long time. And it's vital that Congress gives it enough funding, gives Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service enough funding in order to implement it to its fullest capacity so that the species listed under the ESA can be properly protected. Second recommendation is to join relevant international agreements. These include the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Convention on Migratory Species so that we can be having this conversation at an international level and learning from other nations that are also working toward these same goals. Because of course, species decline and extinction don't respect national boundaries. And third, to implement the national biodiversity strategy that's currently outlined in House Resolution 69 to create this whole of government approach to setting and meeting conservation goals so that each agency and department as they implement their own agendas, keep these priorities top of mind and really elevate biodiversity as a high priority within the work that they're doing. On that note, I will end, uh, I welcome any questions that anyone may have at the end, and I'll turn it over to Ingrid. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kate. So hopefully I can do a pretty seamless screen share here. All right, hopefully you can all see this. Um, well, thanks again, Kate, uh, for starting us off with this panel that covers a lot of ground. Um, my name is Ingrid Segerman. I'm the Director of Regulatory Policy for the ASPCA. And I'm really happy to be with you all tonight. Um, so to give you a little bit of a roadmap, we will be moving from the topic that Kate just covered related to endangered species. Um, I will be talking about farm animals and then we'll be sort of moving back into the wildlife space. Um, however, there's a nexus between the topic that Kate just covered and um, my talk, uh, which is climate change. And I'm gonna be talking about an industry that is a major contributor to climate change. Specifically, I'll cover the harms of factory farming, the connections between the harms to animals, people, and the environment within the industrial animal agriculture system, and the need to shift away from factory farming to kinder, better systems to mitigate these harms and increase human resilience. 
So the vast majority of the 10 billion farm animals raised for food in the United States are raised on factory farms. What does that matter? Uh, why, what are factory farms and what are the harms we're talking about here? So the Environmental Protection Agency or EPA defines animal feeding operations and concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs based on size. Specifically, um, they base it on the number of animals raised at any one facility, and that differs from species to species, depending on the type of animal uh, and the type of food product they're being raised for. Um, so just to sum it up, I have included here an infographic from a 2020 report by Food and Water Watch. Um, it's called Factory Farm Nation, if you're interested in checking it out, which shows average factory farm sizes for different species. Um, so you can see how large these uh, farms are, and those are just average sizes. Factory farms are also concentrated in certain rural regions of the country, um, usually in lower income counties, uh, where they disproportionately harm lower income communities uh, and communities that include people of color. But most important, more important than size or location, Factory farms are defined by a set of shared characteristics, um, all related to how they're harming animals, people, and the land. Factory farms mistreat animals by confining them in cramped barns or caged systems where the animals can express natural behaviors and they rarely have access to sunlight, um, much less the outdoors or fresh air. This industry is also one of the worst polluters. Globally, industrial animal agriculture produces more greenhouse gas emissions than all of the world's transportation combined. It also generates hundreds of millions of tons of manure annually in the United States, polluting our air and waterways. Factory farms also cause tremendous harms to communities and to the people who live there. A 2008 Pew report looked at the impacts of factory farms over the previous 50 years on rural communities, uh, and the report found that the encroachment of industrial agriculture operations result in a host of community harms, including lower relative incomes for certain segments of the community, uh, greater income inequality and poverty, a less active main street, decreased retail trade, and fewer stores generally in the community. Factory farms also have the potential to breed disease because if you think about it, it's sort of the perfect storm of factors. You have confinement and crowding of animals, plus animal waste, and that creates the perfect breeding grounds for pathogens to arise and to spread rapidly through populations of animals. Um, sometimes they can be zoonotic diseases, which as we know, have direct impacts on human health. So not only does this industry contribute to climate change, Climate change has also exacerbated its harms and its impacts. Hurricanes and other unpre unprecedented large weather events have caused flooding of the lagoons where factory farms store animal manure. Um, and that's what's pictured in the photo on the top left here, which shows a hog farm in Eastern North Carolina in September 2018, right after Hurricane Florence caused so much damage in that state, in that region. So the pink area is a lagoon of pig excrement, which flooded and spilled over onto the nearby waterway. And those are very common occurrences. Um, and this other photo here is a 2016 aerial view of the land surrounding the Coronado feedlot in Texas. Um, and that feedlot holds 60,000 cattle. So to quantify the sheer amount of cruelty and harm to animals at factory farms, it makes sense to look at conditions for chickens raised for meat um, because they comprise so many factory farmed animals. The industry refers to these chickens as broiler chickens and chickens raised in the super consolidated industry where only a few companies control really every aspect of their lives are basically treated as growing machines. They're treated much more like widgets than as sentient live animals. Uh, and the breed of chicken used today, the Cornish cross, is specifically designed to grow super quickly uh, to yield highest levels of productivity. This means that by the time chickens reach two weeks old, they can barely move. They then continue to grow, unable to move around easily, 
much less exhibit natural behaviors or enjoy life for about four weeks until they reach slaughter weight at six weeks old. The environmental and community harms of this industry are also severe and measurable. Chicken factory farms emit ammonia and produce billions of pounds of manure every year. Um, this April 2020 report by the Environmental Integrity Project found that the industry in the Chesapeake Bay watershed area, which is home to the highest concentration of chicken factory farms, uh, continues to grow. So this isn't a problem that is stopping. Um, and these farms continue to encroach on locals, locals' homes and they lower their quality of life. The poultry waste has increased, uh, resulting in 24 million pounds of nitrogen water pollution annually at this point. Um, and one factor that has actually contributed to that increased level of poultry waste is the heavier birds being raised and the more intensive crowding of birds. The EPA has stated an intention to monitor and possibly regulate ammonia emissions from poultry farms. However, they're way behind in these efforts. Um, now moving to another um, beloved animal, pigs. The 120 million pigs raised on industrial farms also suffer tremendously. Pigs can solve puzzles are, and are as smart or smarter than your average family dog. Um, but in factory farms, they're raised indoors in barren crates or pens where they don't have the ability to root um, or express other natural behaviors. They live in these crowded conditions without fresh air or sunlight. Um, you have probably heard about gestation crates, which are where mother, pen, mother pigs live. Um, and these crates restrict their ability to even turn around or fully stretch their limbs. Like chicken farming, industrial pig farming also has severely uh, ill effects on communities. The industrial pig farming industry is very intensely concentrated in just a few areas. 38% uh, of North Carolina counties and 94% of Iowa counties rank extreme or severe for factory farm pig density. Uh, the counties with the most extreme densities are lower income counties meaning that these polluting farms disproportionately impact lower income communities, immigrant communities, and communities that include people of color. Neighbors of pig farms can suffer from a variety of physical and mental conditions uh, caused by the noxious odors, airborne particulate matter, and gases that are emitted from these mega pig farms. And you can see um, a photo of, of you know, the size we're talking about for some of these farms. So there are a lot of harmful impacts, um, you know, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, connected with factory farms. And the ASPCA has undertaken research that shows that the harms to animals and the resulting harms to the environment and public health are actually very interrelated. So with the crowding of animals in factory farms, um, we're seeing that there are direct connections to public health consequences. In addition to the um, pretty clear environmental harms from their wastes that enter our waterways um, and can enter the air. So crowding of laying hens in factory farms leads to higher rate of salmonella, which can result in foodborne illness. And the contact with waste um, is another consequence from crowding that leads to foodborne illness. Crowding of animals also necessitates the widespread uh, prophylactic application of antibiotics meaning that producers indiscriminately administer antibiotics to entire populations of animals to prevent disease rather than treating individual animals when they become ill. Um, and this is a huge, huge problem because it contributes to antibiotic resistance, um, which can affect consumers, workers in the farms and communities. The appalling conditions for workers at Slaughterhouse slaughterhouses is a hot topic right now, um, which you may have heard about for all the wrong reasons. Um, according to data collected by the Food and Environment Reporting Network, as of today, um, at least 57,000 meatpacking workers have contracted COVID-19 working in these facilities, and at least 284 slaughterhouse workers have died. And although the USDA won't release data about how many of their own inspectors have contracted the virus, we know that at least five USDA uh, inspectors have died. 
a few weeks ago, uh, John Oliver highlighted this issue on last week tonight and actually gave a very comprehensive um, view of what's been happening in a feature segment on the dangers of slaughterhouses, particularly during the pandemic. And one factor we're very concerned about that makes slaughterhouses even more dangerous places for workers, um, as well as for animals and for consumers, is the blindingly fast slaughter speeds that the industry has been lobbying for and which the USDA has now allowed, including during COVID. Extreme speed slaughter means that animals are at greater risk of inhumane slaughter and handling. When lines run faster, it's harder to ensure that animals are rendered senseless before slaughter, which is a requirement of the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, and it's harder for inspectors to catch violations of humane handling laws and regulations. Slaughterhouse workers already suffer higher rates of injury than factory workers in other settings, and fast line speeds have been linked to even greater rates of injury. Workers are exploited by companies, compromising their quality of life, and line speed can play a role in this. Uh, further, faster line speeds have been linked to higher rates of meat contamination. A recent story in the Washington Post revealed that the Trump administration failed to disclose data showing that pig slaughterhouses operating at these faster speeds had higher contamination rates than traditional plants before they moved forward with a rule that would allow all pig slaughterhouses to convert to the system allowing for faster speeds. So it's very clear that COVID-19 has highlighted the industrial model's fragility and slaughterhouses, in slaughterhouses, as well as throughout the whole system. And there have been great costs to people and animals. Uh, this, oper this industry operates using a just-in-time model, meaning that animals are continuously raised and then sent to slaughter. Um, and here's how an, in an agricultural economist from Purdue University described um, this nature of the industry. Farms typically operate on the assumption that they'll be able to send off mature pigs to slaughter so that pigs still being grown have room to live. There isn't much excess capacity if the mature pigs have to stick around due to slaughterhouse bottlenecks. And that's exactly what has happened uh, during COVID with some tragic effects. At slaughterhouses, workers stand shoulder to shoulder on the slaughter line and meatpacking companies fail to protect them or implement any social distancing measures when COVID emerged. So they quickly became COVID hotspots with fatal and tragic consequences. Some slaughterhouses were then forced to shut down, others had to slow down due to staffing shortages, and this led to an excess number of animals awaiting slaughter on farms, including animals who were actually um, outgrowing the slaughter equipment. And this led to farmers uh, turning towards something called intentional depopulation, meaning that they had to kill entire flocks or herds of animals that couldn't get to slaughter. And we've been fighting to prohibit government reimbursement for two particularly cruel forms of intentional depopulation um, called ventilation shutdown and water-based foam. Uh, ventilation shutdown involves uh, locking a flock or herd of animals in a building and turning off the ventilation system. As the temperature rises, gases inside the building accumulate and the animals suffocate to death. And this is usually over a period of many hours, a very painful death. Um, Water-based foam, which is commonly used in the poultry industry, essentially drowns or suffocates animals. So with the influx of horrifying stories about factory farming um, and the harms this industry causes, uh, the ASPCA was curious about whether public sentiments around these issues were shifting because of the pandemic. So in November 2020, we conducted a national public opinion poll on attitudes towards industrial animal agriculture. Um, and the results were overwhelming. Nearly nine out of 10 respondents said that they were concerned about industrial animal agriculture, and they cited animal welfare, worker safety and or public health risks as the reason for their concern. It's clear that factory farming is a major problem on multiple fronts, and we know that the public is very concerned about these impacts. So what are we doing to tackle this huge problem? Um, the ASPCA is working to advance a suite of policy solutions to address these harms. And the general theme is to encourage a shift away from this harmful industrial system towards a kinder system that will be better not just for animals, 
but for people and will increase resiliency and mitigate some of these um, public health risks. So one particular policy we've been fighting for is um, to stop extreme speed slaughter. Even before these harms came to a head during the pandemic, we have been working with a diverse coalition of stakeholders representing not just animal welfare, but workers' rights, consumer safety, and the environment to reverse this industry-driven um, push to deregulate and speed up animal slaughter. And one immediate goal is passage of the Safe Line Speeds in COVID-19 Act, which would prohibit slaughterhouses from operating at these dangerously fast speeds during the pandemic. We're anticipating that next week, Representative Rosa DeLaro of Connecticut will be reintroducing the House bill and Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey will be reintroducing the Senate bill. We've also worked to advance this issue through the annual appropriations process that funds the US Department of Agriculture. And finally, we are appealing to the Biden-Harris administration to reverse these harmful policies. But more than just tackling um, these uh, policies that we think are harmful, we believe this industry really needs to be transformed. Um, so in addition to advocating for better regulations and reversals of harmful policies, we're advocating for a shift totally away from this system towards better, more resilient systems. We're working to advance programs and policies that incentivize higher welfare farming, including welfare certification programs and plant-based alternatives. And we also support the Farm System Reform Act, which is legislation that was introduced last Congress, which would prevent this industry from continuing to balloon um, by placing an immediate moratorium on the construction and expansion of existing large CAFOs uh, and by phasing out all large CAFOs um, by 2040. And, you know, it's not just uh, banning those CAFOs moving forward. Uh, it, also has a goal of helping producers shift away so that they don't lose their livelihoods um, and shift towards more humane systems through voluntary debt relief and financial transition assistance. Uh, and finally, back to climate change. The Biden-Harris administration has identified you know, four top priorities that they're focusing on for the first 100 days, COVID, climate change, economic recovery, and advancing racial equity. Um, and there's arguments to be made that there's intersections with all of those priorities when it comes to factory farms. Um, but we have particularly been focused on um, their work to combat the climate crisis. Um, we believe that animal agriculture needs to be at the top of the list of uh, industries to regulate. The environmental impacts of the system are unsustainable. So reform is really inevitable. The question is just how much more damage are we going to allow to occur uh, before the industry changes its ways. And we recently joined a letter with 64 other groups urging USDA Secretary Vilsack to take action on three key factory farm reforms um, under a recent executive order protecting public health and the environment. And we really see those as uh, first steps towards reforming this industry, but we're looking forward to continuing to work with a strong group um, of broad interests um, to really bring about positive change, not just for animals, but for people, the environment, um, and to help even prevent future pandemics. Um, and with that, I will turn things over to Kate Wall, who will be focusing on the wildlife trade. Thank you so much, Ingrid. Let me see if I can share my screen as seamlessly as you did. I think you have to stop sharing yours first, okay. <laughs> All right, well, again, thank you, Ingrid. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, thanks to all of you for being here. Um, if you're joining us from the East Coast, as I know my fellow panelists and I are, you're, you're taking a lot of time out of your evening in particular, and we really appreciate it. So I think the common theme that you will have noticed in our presentations this evening is that a lot of the ills that we are experiencing currently from climate change to the pandemic um, 
are really caused by behaviors around our treatment of animals collectively as a society. I'm gonna delve a little bit deeper into subjects touched on by both Kate and Ingrid around wildlife and human health. The importance of changing the way we interact with wildlife on a personal individual level and as a global society to protect human health, both at home and around the world. We're gonna go do this by going through just a few ways that we really need to rethink our, our treatment of animals. To start with, maybe the first zoonotic pandemic that any of us in our lifetimes has been familiar with has been HIV. And many of us didn't recognize HIV as a zoonotic pandemic, but thought of it, I don't know, for myself as something that came out of nowhere and has been a, a real force in at least most of my lifetime. But HIV actually originated in the 1920s in what is now Kinshasa, the capital of the, <laughs> I'm sorry, my cat just attacked my foot, of, <laughs> um, of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So in the 1920s, Kinshasa was a railway hub and it was attracting men in particular from all over the continent to work on railways, to move goods like ivory from the center of the continent to the Atlantic Ocean and then to Europe, America, and, and other points. The suspected patient zero for HIV is someone who either through the bushmeat trade or through individual hunting came into contact with chimpanzees, a specific chimpanzee and developed this new disease that we didn't recognize until the 1980s. So simian immunodeficiency virus or SIV is um, endemic to chimpanzees and other primates. And through hunting and consumption of chimpanzee meat, this initial patient essentially caught SIV, which developed into HIV in him. And that HIV infection is responsible for HIV-1 group M, which is the strain responsible for the pandemic that has killed millions of people around the world and continues to kill hundreds of thousands of people every year. I think the most recent data was something around 800,000 people for 2018. So still nearly a million people every year are dying as a result of HIV, which came directly from consumption of wildlife. What's less, what's become more understood, and let me, let me go back a little bit and give you some more detail, because this all happened, this built very gradually, and it was a perfect storm. There have been a lot of of um, stories and, and finger pointing around HIV, the reality is this initial patient developed the virus because of zoonotic spillover and then was living in this railway hub where men outnumbered women two to one and a, a thriving prostitution industry developed as a result of that. At the same time, in the early 20th century, there were drives to treat illnesses that had not been treatable before through uh, injections of various medicines and treatments. Unfortunately, there wasn't an understanding that we needed to clean those needles and sterilize those needles. So shared needles as a result of medical procedures were at the same time as the sex trade causing HIV to spread throughout this thriving population. From there, it spread throughout the African continent and to points outside of Africa, but it was many decades before we recognized that HIV had become a global pandemic. So again, this all began from one incident of zoonotic spillover. At the same time, HIV has spilled over, or rather SIV has spilled over from simian populations into human beings many other times. Most of those strains have actually remained confined to West Africa where they originated, 
they remain as deadly as the HIV group M, HIV-1 group M that we all know about as a global pandemic, but they ravage for whatever reason, only the localities where they first originated. So this is an issue not only for the global population and not only for those on the front lines of a zoonotic spillover, but this is an illustration of how our interaction with wildlife can have both local and international ramifications. So moving on from consumption to the wildlife trade, there's a lot of talk and there has been a lot of talk, especially since COVID-19 has um, garnered so much attention around how to crack down on wildlife trade in a way that can protect us against pandemics. And some of that discussion has revolved around legal versus illegal wildlife trade. And I wish that we could be in person because I'd really like to hear from folks what you think the difference is between legal and illegal wildlife trade. But I can answer that as far as wildlife are concerned, there isn't one. We have laws that we base, we base our laws on sort of the abundance of species, the limited amount of knowledge that we have around whether a species may or may not cause disease in human beings, um, the conditions in which species are hunted or captured from the wild, the conditions of governance in the country of origin. But those are all human constructs. And the reality is that we know very little about exactly what species may or may not cause disease spillover events. And our legal, our reference points for legal and illegal are largely unknown to the species or entirely unknown to the species. So they, a species is not gonna say, well, I am legally traded and therefore I cannot cause you harm. We know that the live wildlife market in Wuhan, China, which as far as we can tell so far was the originating point of COVID-19, sold both legal and illegal wildlife for human consumption and for other uses. According to my colleagues at IFA who work in China, when the Chinese government went in and tested areas of that market, they found that most COVID was in the sections of the market where legally traded wildlife was being sold. So there is no real protection for us in saying we simply need to crack down on illegal wildlife trafficking that is unlikely to have any real measurable effect on the spread of pandemics. Now we know about wildlife markets because we're living in a world where we have to get together virtually, where instead of having this conversation in a room where we can see one another and read one another's facial expressions, we are looking at one another through the fisheye lens of Zoom. We know about consumption because we just learned about it through the slide on HIV. And we know that, that the most likely um, animal of origin for COVID-19 was being sold for human consumption in the Wuhan market. But that's not the only place where wildlife trade can pose dangers. I was surprised to learn when I started reading about zoonotic spillover events that in 2003, here in the United States, we had an outbreak of monkeypox. That monkeypox originated from the pet trade in fact, that monkeypox originated from native prairie dogs in the pet trade, but they didn't get it. Um, they didn't come to buy the monkeypox from um, native sources. In fact, on April 9th, 2003, a shipment of small mammals arrived in Texas from Ghana. And those small mammals were housed in Illinois with a number of prairie dogs who were then sold on to, as pets around the Midwest. And as a result of that, uh, dozens of people throughout the Midwest developed monkeypox once those little prairie dogs who had been exposed to monkeypox during the pet trade started to shed the virus and show symptoms. And after a long and agonizing search, the CDC was finally able to uh, trace the outbreak back to this pet trade. So again, this common thread is how humans are interacting with wildlife, 
the African pouched rodents that were some of the initial carriers of the monkeypox did not choose to have interaction with native species in the United States, they were brought here as part of the pet trade for consumers because of consumer demand. So our individual choices can really have an impact on our safety, both as individuals and as a society. Again, the pet trade is not the only vector for wildlife-borne diseases to spill over into human beings. Another very well-known uh, vector is, or a very well-known disease is Ebola. We've all heard about it. Many of us have probably been afraid of it. Um, I was traveling in Southern Africa a couple of years ago and watching white knuckled in an airport as we were seeing report, reports of countries shutting down their air travel in the region because of an Ebola outbreak. It's a terrifying disease. And again, it is largely thought to be a result of human encroachment into habitat. Just like wildlife markets where species, where wild species are coming into unusual contact with human beings and in stressful situations because in wildlife markets or in the wildlife trade, wild animals are often confined in unsanitary, uh, tiny enclosures, maybe stuffed next to one another, uh, maybe stuffed next to species with whom they would never normally mix in the wild, creating a perfect petri dish for disease to uh, mix and then spill over into additional populations. As we encroach into native habitats, we are stressing wildlife by the removal of food sources, migration routes, um, and simply through our presence. We are also putting ourselves into closer contact with those species. And several outbreaks of Ebola have been linked to human beings really mixing very closely with bats. In some instances, having bats roost in their homes because they have built homes in a native bat habitat. So again, this is, this is an instance of human behavior that we have the capacity to change. Must we stop all development? No, but must we look at how that development impacts native species? Yes, because if we, if we don't take that step, then we continue to put ourselves at great risk of developing new zoonotic illnesses. And another really big vector of zoonotic outbreak is actually biodiversity loss itself. Kate Delewski talked a lot about the biodiversity crisis and how this can have devastating impacts on the environment, on climate, and on human well being. One of those impacts is an increase in zoonotic spillover events. It's not really well understood yet. This is still an area where scientists are exploring for more data. But we're starting to understand that there is such a thing as a dilution effect. And what that can mean is that when you have more biodiversity, you have, there are a couple of ways it can work. In one instance, perhaps you have a reservoir species that uh, where a zoonotic illness is endemic, say bats who we think may be the reservoir, the initial host species for Ebola. Well, that species may be bitten by a mosquito who, where there's high biodiversity, has a number of different vertebrates that it can feed on. And in so feeding, um, it is more likely to find additional uh, intermediary hosts that are not good at incubating that virus. So and I'm just making this up. Say you have a, a bat or you have a mosquito that feeds on a cat and a dog and a chipmunk and a squirrel and a monkey and um, a hippopotamus and then on a human being. Well, maybe the human being can contract Ebola, but all of these other species are unable to contract Ebola. And since most of the mosquitoes feeding is taking place, um, in species where Ebola can't move forward, it's helping to break the life cycle of 
of that virus. And again, I'm making that up. I don't believe that Ebola can be transmitted through mosquito bites, but that's sort of one um, instance of how a dilution effect could work. Perhaps uh, talking about Zika would be a better one. If you have higher biodiversity, you're going to see less spillover of Zika from mosquito populations into human beings because mosquitoes are feeding on a variety of different organisms before they get to human beings, making it less likely for Zika to be transmitted. In other ways, um, predator species may change the behavior of the host species. So if you have lots of frogs in an area that are feeding on mosquitoes, maybe those mosquitoes will go preferentially to an, a different area, or there will be fewer mosquitoes to um, carry on zoonotic diseases that might otherwise spill over into the population. And we actually see this in real life and here in the United States. So for instance, Lyme disease is much less likely to spill over into human populations in areas where there's a high biodiversity of small mammals. And that is because um, the ticks that that carry Lyme disease are going to be feeding more preferentially on those small mammals than they are in human beings. And again, with Zika, where you see higher biodiversity, you see lower incidence of human transmission. So we are really protecting ourselves as we invest in protecting biodiversity and protecting animals that are on the brink of extinction from becoming extinct and helping those animal populations to rebound to normal population levels. Not only are we contributing to healthy ecosystems and environments, again, on which we all depend, but we are in a very real way protecting ourselves, inoculating ourselves against zoonotic spillover. So what else can we do? I mean, obviously we need to start thinking about how we can change our behavior as individuals and as a society. We can also look at changing laws. There's a law um, currently under consideration in both the House and the Senate called the Preventing Future Pandemics Act. This is a truly bipartisan law. In the Senate, it is championed by John Cornyn, a Republican of Texas, along with Cory Booker, a Democrat of New Jersey. And if you know anything about politics and um, senators in particular, you know that that's a very unlikely pairing and I think bodes really well for the future. In the House, it's championed by Democrat uh, Quigley and uh, Republican Fred Upton of Michigan. Again, a very bipartisan showing. And what the bill would do is make it illegal to import or export or sell live wildlife for human consumption in the United States. And that's recognizing that it's not just live wildlife markets outside of the United States that can be an issue. We have to look here at home at our behavior and how we change our behavior in order to protect against zoonotic spillover. Now, the bill also recognizes that the United States can't do this alone. So it provides funds and guidance to allow the United States to take a leadership role within the international community using carrots and not sticks to encourage other nations around the world to take similar steps. That is outlawing the import, export and consumption of live wildlife for human consumption. Recognize that this is a fairly small sliver. We've talked about a lot of different things that we need to be looking at, including trade in pets, um, trade habitat destruction and um, biodiversity loss writ large. But again, if you know anything about politics, you will probably recognize that it can be very difficult to get large and sweeping legislation through Congress. And the fact that a bipartisan quartet of members from all over the country recognize the need to address at least this sliver of wildlife trade is really good um, and positive outlook. But we need to go beyond individual legislation. We need to look at One Health, and many of you probably will have heard of this in the wake of COVID-19 because the concept of One Health or One Welfare has become much more prominent in our daily discourse. 
Now, what One Health propounds is that there is a relationship, as we've seen throughout this discussion, from Kate to Ingrid to this, this current panel, there is a link between human health, environmental health, and animal health. Unfortunately, a lot of the way One Health has been practiced in, since its inception um, within the last decade or so is to look at environmental health and animal health with an eye to recognizing zoonotic spillover events as they occur and trying to contain them. So one of the things that we at IFA and many of our partners, including ASPCA and AWI are working to do is really change the concept of One Health to be one that is really more truly One Welfare, recognizing that we need to protect the integrity and health of animals, of the environment with, and recognize that by protecting the health of our fellow creatures in situ, we are not containing zoonotic spillover, we are preventing it. And that really needs to be the true impetus for our policies. So we are working with the administration and with champions in both the US House and the US Senate, and frankly, within the international community, community um, with international organizations to really try to bring an, a new way of thinking, a transformational way of thinking to our interaction as a species with other species, be they uh, domestic animals in a farm setting, wild animals in the wild, um, our domestic animals at home, and recognize that we can't truly be healthy, we cannot have true health and well being as human beings and as individuals unless the least among us have true health and well-being. And that includes animals and our environment. Only when we recognize that we are all truly interconnected and that our health and well-being is really interconnected and start making decisions based on that interconnection and based on the idea that one health and one welfare includes our entire planet, uh, will we be in a position to truly be protecting ourselves against the next pandemic. So thank you so much. I think it's time to open this up for questions if any of you are still with us and awake. And again, I thank you for being with us tonight. So most of our, our, all of our questions so far have been answered in the chat. So if you've asked a question this far, you can, uh, go read the answer if you haven't seen it yet. Otherwise, uh, you are welcome to ask any additional questions in the next couple minutes before we wrap up. And Lisa, it looked like someone in the Q&A asked for our email addresses because Kate Wall definitely put hers in her presentation. Kate Zalewski might have as well. I forgot to, but we did drop our emails um, in the answer to that question. So feel free to follow up with questions you may have. Seeing as we have not gotten any new questions and it is 6.36, I think it is time to wrap up. Thank you so much for your time, for attending, for presenting. Thank you. Thanks very much for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks so much, everyone. Good night. Bye.